A warm welcome to another GIB webinar. I'm Jay Palmer, GIB's Chief Exec, and I'll be chairing your event today. Um, today we'll be joined by two eminent presenters, John Whitefoot, Head of Employee Industrial Relations at HS2, and delighted to welcome Sylvia Cashman, Employee Relations Strategic Advisor for May Stragados. Um, HS2, um, which is Europe's largest infrastructure project, is expected to create over 30,000 jobs and promises to create uh, another whopping 2,000 apprenticeships as well as supporting the UK's skills agenda. However, like many projects, major projects of this scale, it faces many, many challenges, I'm sure. And today's webinar aims to um, help us better understand how those industrial relations will be supported and importantly for us today, um, how this creates opportunities for GIB uh, members. With the publication that John's going to talk a little bit about of the Code of Practice, it's really pleasing for me to see that the GRB's national agreement is prominently at the front and centre of the Code and critically reinforces the requirement for the workforce to be directly employed by Tier 1 and its supply chain. Um, John's, our speakers will explain why they're very keen um, to work with firms that are highly skilled competent and healthy workforce, and importantly, the role GIB members uh, will play in part of that success. John will provide a high-level overview of HS2's perspective, and then drill into some of the development and the importance of the company's code of practice, and why the GIB agreement will help to strengthen the success of the project. We'll turn on to Sylvia. Sylvia will uh, provide a really helpful, rich um, perspective from the major contractors' perspective working with HS2 and why the operation of the GIB agreement and the role our members can play is vital importance to the supply chain and delivery of the project of this scale. Um, just to remind delegates, we do have a dedicated Q&A, so if I could ask you to hold all your questions until the presenters have finished, then we'll have um, hopefully a very engaging and interactive um, session. I think it's also a good opportunity if you could pop in, not only just questions for the presenters, but anything that's um, on your mind that you want to perhaps share with, with, with the audience, we can read those out as well, um, so that we can get, get your foot your foot to use. Um, I'm sure you're all familiar now with Zoom. If not, just a reminder, there is a Q&A box um, at the center of the screen that you can post your questions in the Q&A and then uh, we'll, we'll try to get around to as many as we can. And um, again, the both speakers have said if we can't get around to all the questions or we can't answer them on the, on the webinar, we will certainly get back, back to you. Right, so let's get this road on the show. Um, we can have the next slide and over to you, John. Well, th thanks ever so much, Jay. Um, hello, everyone. Um, my name is John Whitefoot and I'm uh, currently the Head of Employee and Industrial Relations at HS2. I joined the business in 2018, so it's coming up to three years now. Uh, I'd first like to say thanks to Roger, uh, Jay and the JIB team for inviting me to join you today um, to speak a little bit about employee and industrial relations on the project. Essentially, this will be through the lens of the client. Um, I only have one slide and I will uh, try to stick to my allocated time, which will allow time uh, to hear from others and hopefully stimulate a good discussion. By way of providing a, a little backdrop uh, to my presentation, I'll begin by sharing a few facts about employment on the project. I will then go on to talk a little bit about the recent history of IR on the project, um, where we are today and the future direction of travel from both a strategic and transactional level of ER and IR on the project. And uh, how the JOB can play an important can make an important contribution to the delivery of the of the project. So, work on HS2, as we all know, is uh, already well underway, and we have over two hundred and fifty active sites. Uh, we've announced around a ten billion ten billion pounds worth of contracts. By the end of next year, that will uh, increase to around twenty billion. Um, businesses and employers in every region uh, uh, of the UK uh, are helping to, to, to build HS2. Um, there are now 15,000 jobs supported by the programme, and there are around 2,000 businesses that are currently working on the project. 
98% of contracts are going to UK based businesses, um, 70% with uh, smaller, medium sized enterprises, and over a, around a thousand direct SME contracts in situ at the moment. As we move and increase the pace of construction on phase one, HS Tunis contractors are, are recruiting uh, for over 20,000 new roles. So that's 20,000 new roles that we will be recruiting um, with our contractors during phase one. Um, just a little uh, uh, statistic on uh, apprentices. Uh, there are currently 600 of the 2,000 expected apprentices already on board. Um, I just want to share with you a view from the bridge, if you like, me arriving at HS2 in 2018 and just give you an eye level feel for, for the observations that, that, that I made uh, over the initial few months uh, in the role. Um, as I say, eye level, typically low levels of uh, lower levels of union density. Um, in contrast to other sectors that I've worked with in the past. Um, pockets of mistrust on both sides of the industry. Uh, remembered pain associated with the legacy of blacklisting, I guess. And most strikingly, the demography, demography of the workforce in the sector. I wasn't aware um, before I arrived at HS2 that around 50% of uh, employees uh, workers, people engaged in the UK construct, construction sector are non-direct employment. There's not, it's not, it's different forms of non-direct employment, if you like. So half of the sector uh, currently not, not engaged through direct employment as such. So whilst um, subcontracting and self-employment and that will no doubt remain essential features of the construction industry generally. There appears to be little doubt to me that the fragmentation of the labour supply that we've witnessed over a number of decades now have likely exacerbated some of uh, the age old challenges faced in the industry in such areas as safety, quality, uh, skills, efficiency, productivity and innovation and so forth. I was interested to come across some research commissioned, commissioned by the JAB, carried out by uh, Howard Gospel, Professor, Professor Howard Gospel, um, into the impact of non-direct employment in the electrical contracting industry and in the construction industry generally. Um, it makes for some very interesting informative reading, and if you haven't had an opportunity to, to read it, I would strongly encourage you to do so. Um, so what have we been doing at a strategic level of employing industrial relations? Well, very briefly, in 2016, HS2 signed up to an initial framework agreement with, with the TUC, uh, the IFA as it's known. Uh, it contains, the IFA contains joint commitments to shared values and common purpose with regard to the importance of uh, respect at work, uh, the potential for partnership at work, um, equality, diversity and inclusion, exemplary health, safety and well-being on the project, and a commitment to legacy, um, maximising the economic and social regeneration uh, that this project affords the opportunity for us to, to create. We report on progress at quarterly collaboration meetings with the TUC. Um, these meetings are attended by essentially the five unions currently involved on the programme, um, Unite, um, GMB, the ASLEF, RMT, and the Transport and Salary Staffs Association, the TSSO. So in terms of um, employee and industrial relations here at HS2 Limited, i.e. for our own directly employed staff, we entered into a voluntary single union recognition agreement uh, with the TSSA. Uh, and, and around about May 2019. Um, the HS2 TSSA National Collective Engagement Framework, it's true to say is a modern partnership agreement um, and it's working well. Um, we're developing that relationship uh, and strengthening that relationship, but having a, 
uh, an agreement, which is the outcome of joint discussions with with uh, with the union, has put us in a what I believe to be a on a sound footing for managing our relationship with our uh, trade union, our recognised trade union. So HS2 has, has kind of established the mechanisms to engage with its own staff. Um, the tier one contractors engaged in the, in the construction and operation of this railway will, will have their own relationships with their own workforce and the trade unions that, that represent them. Um, I think it's important to say that ultimately the responsibility for ensuring good employment practice and, and managing employee and industrial relations external, if you like, to HS2 Limited resides with the tier one, con tier one joint venture contractors and all tiers of their supply chain, their workforces and their workplace representatives. So um, in terms of what we've been doing in relation to working with our joint venture partners in the arena of, of industrial relations, um, look, we regard regular engagement with our tier one contractors as a, a critical success factor for overseeing the promotion of good employment practice. And, and fostering a constructive climate of employee and industrial relations on the project, simple as that. Last year, HS2 and our tier one contractors established and signed up to this uh, employee and industrial relations code of practice. Um, this EIR code, Roger, could you put the slide up for me now, please? Would that be possible? Oh, that, that's great, thanks. Um, look, it's, it's the EIR code of practice is essentially the purpose of this code is to uh, establish an employee relations framework under which us as clients and our tier one contractors and all tiers of their supply chain uh, will promote good employment practices and employee and industrial relations, but in a practical sense. There's a saying, isn't there, that fine words don't butter any parsnips. So what we've, what we've attempted to do, and I think we have succeeded, is creating a framework. It's, all, it's, a, it's of a voluntary nature. It's non-contractual. Like many, many agreements, they're binding in honour only. But in many regards, to have uh, the outcome of discussions on a voluntary basis, uh, to agree uh, on the interpretation and the words on the page, um, on a voluntary basis, for me, at least, I strongly believe that that actually strengthens the words on the page in terms of turning that into practical deliverables and realities. Um, it's not too prescriptive, but it does make important references to requirements expected of our, our tier one contractors and their supply chains in relation to terms and conditions of employment, for example, and industry benchmark standards. So last year, we, after many months actually of, of discussion and negotiation, if you like, uh, we managed to produce the, um, the code. Um, in terms of uh, promoting openness and transparency, Whilst the unions didn't hold the pen or were, the unions weren't involved in the discussions between us as clients and our tier one contractors. And I know uh, union colleagues felt that they would, they would have been able to make a useful contribution to that discussion. But as it turned out, we took the decision that we wanted to produce a code of practice that would, would actually work in practice. Um, and I'm pleased. I'm very pleased with the outcome of the code. What it attempts to do, as is shown on the slide there, we've got our works informations, which loosely defined um, set out from a commercial perspective, what the requirements are on our uh, tier one joint venture partners. We've got the initial framework agreement that we signed up to with the TUC, you know, uh, for five years ago now. And what the ER code of practice is tries to bring together um, those requirements and aspirations are set out in, in the works information and the IFA into one consolidated framework. And 
clearly um, it's our view that if we work together, collaborate in partnership, and we stick to the letter and the spirit, albeit it's not overly prescriptive of the ER code, then we actually believe this will uh, support the promotion of good employment practices and consistency in relation to how employee and industrial relations are managed across the lifetime of, of the contract. We've also established an EIR, Employee and Industrial Relations Forum, uh, again, similar to what existed on Crossrail, for example, but not, but not identical. Uh, we meet bi-monthly. Uh, this is kind of like my equivalence, the leads for EIR out there amongst our JV partners. We meet bi-monthly or as necessary. Um, we share best practice. We discuss any issues or emerging issues around ERIR and it, it, it works well. We're just, we're just concluding an, um, uh, the conclusion of a process whereby we are pulling together, we have pulled together now, uh, the architecture around the auditing and monitoring and reporting of key EIR metrics that HS2 has determined it requires its tier one contractors to report back on. So that's working well. In terms of um, what role can, 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 the, can the JIB play? What is the role? What, what, what value can the JIB add uh, to the project? It, look, well, a key objective of the code itself is to seek to ensure the, the employment policies, procedures, practices operated by the myriad of different employers deployed on the project uh, take account of and reflect the employment standards embodied in what we phrase and term in the uh, code as industry benchmark standards. And industry benchmark standards include uh, well-established national work rule agreements. So adherence to the provisions of the code require that our tier one contractors and their supply chain must make every effort to ensure direct employment of the workforce, at least operatives and first line supervisors, on terms and conditions that are no less favourable than those prescribed within the relevant national work rule agreements. So that's inclusive of welfare benefits and industry sick pay, for example. So and I believe, my team believes that the JIB National Work Rules Agreement is therefore not only relevant to the project, but could play a central role for ensuring the maximum degree of um, uh, consistency and, and uniformity of good employment practice and the promotion of high quality training and the continuous development of the right skills and competences that's going to be required by a successful and productive 21st century construction sector. So coupled with the OIS standards of health and safety and well-being, uh, from an HS2 perspective, these are essential prerequisites for engendering and sustaining good employee and industrial relations practice on the project. And that's, that's essentially, um, I know it was short and sweet, but that's essentially an overview of where we are uh, at HS2 in our journey uh, as we um, quicken the pace, if you like, of uh, constructing the railway. Super, John. Listen, that is, as always, uh, really insightful. I think we've you know, a lot of things that have gone behind the scenes to get us where we are. So I'm sure the audience will want to raise uh, a number of points on, on the areas you've, you've covered. Again, just reminding that we do have a Q&A session um, um, after Sylvia's presentation. So just make sure you hang on to those burning questions that uh, um, after Sylvia's uh, presentation. So listen, Sylvia, it's been a um, pleasure to work with you on this and, and other projects. And I think your, um, your insight, now that you know, you've got a huge amount of experience from Terminal 2 and Terminal 5 and that, those projects have been a success. So it'd be really interesting now that you're at Mace Dragonos to perhaps get your thoughts, Sylvia. So over to you. 
Thank you very much, Jay, and thank you to you and Roger for inviting me to take part. Um, just for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sylvia Cashman. I joined MACE in October 2020. And whilst I'm a, a bit of a newbie to, to MACE itself, um, I've been involved, as Jay said, in delivering industrial relations in the construction um, environment for over, over 20 years. Um, what I'd like to do this afternoon is talk a little bit about, uh, from a MACE perspective, about working with HS2, then talk a little bit about working with national working rule agreements and the JIB specifically, and then moving on to why I think the JIB is important to us as a contractor and also to our supply chain. But before I go on to that, perhaps for those of you who don't um, know a lot about the project, the Euston Station project, let me just give you um, just a half a dozen facts. Um, so MACE is in a 50-50 joint venture with Dragados, so we formed the mace Dragados joint venture. We are responsible for the delivery of the new HS2 Euston station platforms and concourse, as well as the underground station expansion and provision of the new underground interchange with Euston Square station. We're operating in a really high dense and populated area, therefore local community is going to be really important to us to build those relationships and you know, work really hard to minimize the impact on those living and working um, in the area. Local stakeholders outside of the local communities are far and wide. They include retailers and include the Royal College of General Practitioners. They include one of our construction trade unions, the GMB, who are located just around the corner from the station. They also include the Magic Circle, Euston Square Hotel, and to name but a few. In terms of supply chain spend, that's likely to be upwards of 2 billion with an estimated 200 plus subcontracted passengers of, pardon me, pack packages um, of varying um, sizes to be awarded. And then we anticipate that the on-site population at peak will be around 2000 people. So hopefully that's given you a bit of a flavor and context for the project itself. In terms of um, working with HS2, it's a really exciting to be part of this national infrastructure program. Um, it's a great opportunity as well to be working with other major contractors um, on what we see as an opportunity uh, for a new era of partnership working. It's also, I think, a real opportunity for us to demonstrate that, you know, UK PLC can deliver major infrastructure programs really well and that industrial relations can be delivered really well as well. So we've heard John talk a little bit about uh, the requirements that they've set out. Um, the, the, the three documents that form a very comprehensive suite of industrial relations requirements are the TUC framework agreement, the code of practice, which John has talked quite a bit about, and then a works information. The suite of documents is really helpful to us because it um, really outlines the requirements that we will be expected to deliver, but it also reinforces some really important, uh, what I would call people aspects, you know, it references the real living wage that we need to commit to that and we would want to, uh, direct employment, safety and well-being and health and well-being, you know, to name but a few. However, having a number of documents that sort of bring together the overall industrial relations delivery requirements does make it a little bit more complicated for our supply chain. So therefore, our role will be now to translate all of those requirements into something that our supply chain can understand because giving our supply chain real clarity on what will be expected of them is absolutely essential. As a result of that, obviously, we will need to engage with our supply chain uh, really closely. Um, we'll engage with them right at the start through the procurement process, and we will make sure that anyone tendering for work on uh, Houston will be able to deliver the requirements that HS2 has set out for us. And we'll continue that engagement right through their time on the, on the Houston Station um, project. Um, it also brings a real opportunity to engage um, with our trade unions that represent construction workers um, here in the UK, and we, are, we do really welcome that. Where we'll be looking for help uh, from HS2 from is bringing all the contractors who are working together. John's talked about uh, the fact that he brings um, a community together regularly to talk about issues. And that's really important because <clears throat> we need to make sure that we are all um, supporting HS2 in the right way. 
and that none of us are really going off in a tangent, which might make it very difficult for others on other sections of the HS2 programme. Even with the comprehensive suite of um, documents that John and I have referred to, you know, we do recognise that we are uh, operating in a very challenging industry and which has some very entrenched cultures. So, for example, direct employment is not the norm. John mentioned that as well. Um, the growth of the gig economy and actually people's choice about how they want to work. Um, an ageing construction workforce, none under investment in some training, which is why the emphasis is so important around apprentices, lack of diversity, and there's often a very low engagement model um, in uh, construction in the supply chains. So we're really looking forward to working with everyone um, on HS2 and looking to HS2 to help us collectively achieve the legacy that they want to leave. In terms of now working with National Working Rule Agreements and the JIB, <coughs> excuse me, by using National Working Rule Agreements, we firmly believe that they set a level playing field, both from a commercial and industrial relations perspective. So if you're asking contractors to tender for work and you're requiring them to um, deliver or set out their required their expectations against the national working rule agreements and their contents, then you are know, then you know that you are comparing apples with apples and not apples with oranges. And that is really a huge benefit. The JIB in particular has a long history in supporting major infrastructure programs. So that makes it um, a really important uh, agreement to be using. It's well regarded. <clears throat> the infrastructure that supports the work of the JIB is really valuable and can also be relied heavily upon to support its members. And I think we've seen that particularly over the last year <clears throat> during the, the COVID-19 pandemic. One, one other good thing about the JIB is that it's also very scalable. It's easy to use on small to medium projects. And from a personal experience, I've seen it work really well on large uh, infrastructure programs as well. So it brings a real benefit for that. The emphasis that the JIB places on direct employment is absolutely invaluable because we will be carrying that through into the Euston Station project. And also the relationship through the ECS card scheme is really important to us because that means when JIB members come to work on Euston, we can rely on the skills and competency that their workforces will bring into the project. We also welcome the fact that the JIB helps to maintain regular dialogue with Unite the Union and through that helps to promote um, joint working. And we really do welcome that on the Euston Station project. So what do I think um, is really important about um, the JIB and what benefits do I think it will give our supply chain? Well, I think JIB members that come to work with us on Euston will have a real opportunity to demonstrate their ability and passion for having a, what I would call a positive people environment. And that's direct employment, welfare benefits and engagement with their employees. And the JIB is very strong in promoting that. What we do expect then is if they subcontract work further, we do expect that they push that requirement um, into their supply chain as well. JIB members will have access to an established national agreement infrastructure for support and guidance. And whilst we hope things won't go wrong, you know, there's the really tried and tested model of the dispute resolution procedure um, and that can be adopted um, should the need arise. We will also ask our supply chain to engage positively with UNITE, who are the signatory trade union to the JRB agreement. We also think that having a structured national working rule agreement like the JIB will help employers create a level platform of terms and conditions of employment, which if not present, often has a real ability to create IR instability. And having stability in this respect will provide a better platform from which to drive safety, health, well-being, and ultimately better productivity and quality. So just to summarize then, our role will be to help JRB members to deliver to our clients' requirements. We will be fair, but we will equally be tough. Our role is very much to help, to facilitate, and to enable, but we will expect our supply chain to commit to delivering the requirements that HS2 have set out, and if that can't be done, then we will be tough on those subcontractors. But our primary role is to make sure that it all works and we can deliver what we are expected to deliver. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, I always seem to learn something new when I listen to Sylvia. So thank you for that granular perspective and, and sharing, I guess, some of your practical experience into, into the new project. Hope, 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 hope it goes well for you. Uh, May Stragados there as well. Thank you. Um, um, I guess now is probably um, our interactive session, as I promised. Um, we, we, we want to have an engaging and I get a lively discussion on something which is a fantastic platform that our presenters have given us. So really would welcome colleagues that have joined us today to um, push your questions in the Q&A. Again, the Q&A is at the bottom of your screen. You post that, we'll, we'll try to get around to as many questions as we can. Um, the first one that sort of comes up and I know you both have touched on this, so um, probably useful to get both of your perspectives, is the, the, the code itself um, is very much um, leveraging on the use of the JIB agreement. And again, again uh, promise audience, we haven't, the brown envelopes haven't been exchanged in promoting the JIB, but it seems to be embedded into the, um, your thinking and your logic of a, a successful project. John, from your perspective, be useful to, um, get your thoughts on how do you see this being applied in practice? I know you reference a practical nature of that. And Sylvia, it'd be useful to get your, hear your, what role you see major contractors playing in reinforcing that. I know you touched on the sort of how it will be enforced and you know it, but how will you actually do that in practice, reinforcing this down the supply chain? Um, and particularly, you know, with your experience um, of, of, um, Will, 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 it, will it be a structured approach like the practice one we, we saw at T5? Or do you see something different with what we saw at the Olympics or Crossrail? So, John, I don't know if you want to kick off uh, and, and kick, kick share your thoughts. Uh, well, <clears throat> as Sylvia mentioned earlier, as we know, um, the JIB, uh, JIB members um, have access to, to well-established national agreements uh, to use Sylvia's phrase, the infrastructure, national agreement infrastructure. And included in that and within that is uh, an agreed mechanism, for example, for resolving disputes that arise from time to time or may arise from time to time. Um, look, for HS2 as client, we think, oh, well, we, we absolutely are committed to ensuring so far as possible that everybody engaged on the building and operation of this railway are employed on fair, decent terms and conditions of employment. And as a minimum, not as a ceiling, we would expect, in fact, we demand that our contractors, our tier one joint venture contractors, ensure that nobody within tier two, tier three, tier four, supply chain, subcontracting, nobody should be, uh, heaven forbid, um, below any of the industry standards that are encapsulated within the JIB work, national work rule agreement, for example. Whilst we can't insist on our contractors and their subcontractors affiliating to the JIB, for example, what we can do is encourage them to work with organisations that have got credibility, they've been around for a long time. You've been around for a long time. I can remember as an apprentice engineer way back in the 70s, you know, when the JIB, not, not long after the JIB was established. Um, back in the day, um, the unions, many employers actually recognised the value of having uh, a firm commitment to ensuring the highest standards of competency and skills and health and safety and welfare benefits and the, the great um, and the consistent commitment the JIB has had around apprentices in terms of future proof in the sector. All of these things are to many people, I guess on this call, probably common sense. But as I said earlier, with the fragmentation of the labour supply and the parceling up, if you like, of services and contracts, probably arising out of that old paradigm of uh, compulsory competitive tendering way back in the day, these have created, that this direction of travel has created issues and problems and inconsistencies. 
and we believe that the more that we can anchor our practice and our engagement with our tier one contractors and subsequently them, as Sylvia said, with their supply chain, then that can only be a good thing. It, 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 I, I think it's a prerequisite that we, we don't ignore and turn a, a blind eye to well-established agreements and infrastructures that, are, that over, the, over time have proven to, to add value to, to business and, and, and to employees working in construction. No, that, that's reassuring, reassuring to hear. So, thanks. So, so, from your perspective, um, how, how do you so, see? That? So, um, I touched on the fact that you know when we go out to tender, we will we will assess any tender returns on ability to be able to deliver to HS2's requirements, and that assessment is not to penalise or disregard, but it's to understand how we might be able to help a good contractor who wants to work with us to be able to deliver to those requirements. And once the contractor has joined the project, we will meet with them as they start to understand how they're going to deliver those requirements. And then during their tenure on the project, you know, we will, uh, we will undertake um, some assurance with them together to make sure that the requirements that they start with are the same requirements that are still in place as they, as they continue their time on the project. And again, all of that is not to catch anybody out. It's simply to make sure that we are maintaining that consistent experience for those construction workers on the project um, as, they are, as they stay with us. Um, it's a tried and tested model that I've used um, over my years in construction. And I think if it's managed in the right way, it will really deliver and bring the supply chain together um, and help and just help achieve good IR stability and people engagement on a, on a project. And, and I know uh, delegates may not appreciate subtlety, but the, um, the code of practice is a voluntary code. I yeah, know May, Sylvia, or Mickey, compulsory. Are you able to explain the rationale and your, perhaps, your thoughts around that? Well, John's talked about that a lot of the content of the code of practice is best practice. And if yeah. it is best practice, why would you not want to use that? to look after people whilst they're working from you, for you on, on, on the project. So we've taken the view that we should be looking for that um, in all our contractors that join us. And that's why we are starting to that assessment during the procurement process. And we will continue that assessment whilst they are on site with us at Euston. It is simply, why would you not? Yeah. Um, just some other questions that are coming through. Um, you both pivoted around the subject of direct employment and you, again, John, you finally referenced um, Professor Howard's um, quite impressive research, which he said. Just so that perhaps get your minds and thoughts, and you touched on it, but you know, are you able to sort of pinpoint the commercial advantages that you see from direct employment, um, plus not time, and maybe um, see from the contractor's perspective? What is, what is this commercial advantage that you know will help deliver a successful project? Well, uh, in terms of commercial advantage, I guess Sylvia's better place to, to address that than myself. What, what I would say is that, this, that look, HS2, uh, we require our tier one contractors uh, to provide us uh, with assurance and report on uh, some annually, others quarterly on, for example, uh, modern slavery, health and safety and well-being, equality, diversity, inclusion, skills, education, and employment, terms and conditions, PAYE, zero hour contracts, engagement with trade unions, meetings with trade unions, site visits, and as a minimum alignment with industry benchmark standards. We need to create a level playing field. All of the constituent parts of joint ventures are all in competition. It's not, they don't live and breathe and exist just for the HS2 project. I mean, that they form part, an integral part of UK construction. So from a commercial perspective, I can't speak for 
commercial entities that are engaged on the project. But what I can say is that if we're going to be successful in delivering this uh, railway on time and on budget, we do need to create a, a level playing field. So what we're not looking for is a race to the bottom. If it, we need to be compete, we need to be competing. All of us need to be competing at the higher standards of uh, terms and conditions of employment, not the lowest standards. And every, lots of research over decades has shown that by working collaboratively uh, with all the stakeholders um, that won't be able to agree over everything, but if at the core of the relationships between the unions, the contractors, the tier one contractors and HS2 is a belief in decent modern employment standards that has to be that will work through as as a commercial advantage because the old cliche is you know the higher the level of engagement between workers and their and their line managers the 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 better the customer insights it's proven that the quality of services and products are improved where you have a, a, a positive climate of employee and industrial relations, high levels of, in, of engagement, that's individual engagement as well as collective engagement with the employees and their representatives. It's a no-brainer. Uh, you made that point very powerful. Thanks, Sylvia, what, what's your thoughts on the commercial and the contractors? So, as I said, w when we go out to tender, if you are asking um, contractors to tender based on criteria such as direct employment or other things, then you are comparing apples with apples. Um, as Jay, you and I know, um, other models of employment um, will have different commercial models, but what you're able then to do is to compare like with like. Sure. Equally, I would say the longevity of the programme that we are engaged on gives us the opportunity to provide people with uh, investment in training from apprenticeships through to increasing their skills and capabilities. And I think that is better delivered through a direct employment model. But equally, I would say, there are a number of industry reports that demonstrate that um, best, the best safety you can deliver comes through a directly employed workforce. And one of those reports is Rita Donoghue, um, who, which I think was called One Death is Too Many, which I think was issued in 2009 or something like that. And if you read that, it is a really powerful report that says if you invest in the right employment contract, delivery of safety is a much more achievable thing for, for in construction. And also experience has shown me that actually from engaging with your workforce and making sure you are able to deliver on quality and productivity, that all comes with a, the, the type of employment practice that comes through direct employment. Yeah, so thank, thank, thank you both for that. It's very, very clear and very powerful and it underpins the, the research that the um, sector has carried out. Um, question um, again, um, John and Sylvia, I welcome your thoughts respectively on, on this. Uh, the question is around um, looking at Heathrow um, and, and, and the model of construction at Heathrow Airport where MPA was, was used and there was a real success that was delivered then. So I know you, you were directly involved in some of those. The question being asked is um, will HS2 sign up to the MPA? Um, I don't think that is going to be uh, that, that's going to happen. The MPA was um, a very specific um, agreement that was developed for Heathrow Terminal 5 development, and it matched the requirements of that particular project. Um, I think what we've got here through the requirements that HS2 have set out for us, we've got an equally robust framework in which we can deliver um, the industrial relations um, stability that I think we're all looking for from this programme. Um, and therefore, I wouldn't see us adopting anything like an MPA. We have some good quality requirements, both through the TUC framework agreement and the code of practice. And I think that will really help to deliver what we need to deliver. I, I'd agree with that, Sylvia. I, 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 look, I, I've looked at the MPA and it looks 
on paper a great agreement. It served the test of time and it worked well for the parties. But we are comparing apples with oranges when we when we look at uh, Ethrow and then we look at the sc size scale uh, of the HS2 project. That I don't believe there is a one size fits all, to be honest with you. Um, we've got people coming and going all the time, at different phases of the project. I think what this, gonna, what this is ultimately gonna come down to is trade unions and all the contractors engaged on the HS2 pro pro uh, project um, taking, a, taking a leap of faith, I think, in some instances, because as I said earlier, there is remembered pain. There's a lot of distrust in certain pockets. Uh, I'm, I'm sad that we're in 2021 and I was reading some stuff this morning um, produced uh, in relation to the, 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 the dispute, if you like, or the um, failure to agree at Inkley Point. And some of the language uh, reminded me really of, of when I was a shop steward in the 70s, um, declarations of war and threats and all this kind of stuff. And I think if, if, if this project is going to be successful from an industrial relations and employee relations perspective, I think we do need to leave behind some of the um, less constructive practices in the past and, and build on those areas where we do have a shared aim and objective um, around health and safety and well-being and welfare benefits and ensuring people are not paying for their own pay slips and all sorts of bogus self-employment, which I know characterises much of the sector or, or, or large parts of the sector. What we need to do is pull together. And I think the JIB, I mean, it's not the only industry benchmark standard. It's not the only national works rule. And there's a construction industry joint council that there's a whole host of them. And we've listed, we're not, we're not excluding any. We want to apply the best practice from all and every um, industry, well-established industry framework, as I said. I've stood the test of time, so why wouldn't we want to rally around what we've already agreed on, for example, at JIB level, <clears throat> and make good, and seek to make good on those commitments and turn them into practical outcomes for people that are actually on the front line uh, constructing the railway every day? I I, 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 sorry, uh, no, sort of, uh, sorry to cut across you. Um, it's not, in, in my view, in my honest view, I, I don't believe that uh, an MPA uh, type of agreement across a project of this scale would actually yield the benefits that it, it yielded at, at, at Ethrow, not because of any failure or commitment, because of the practicalities of it. It's the practicalities of turning the commitments into everyday practice. And I, I've mentioned there's thousands of businesses engaged on this project. And we've all got to pull together because there will be pockets of malpractice, as there is in every uh, sector. There will be uh, practices that we need to A, identify and B, stop, cease. I'm not sure. I think just just to finalise my point on this, I think if we all work together under that framework, which is the EIR code, I think that it will deliver what the intention of the MPA was and what indeed what the intention of the IR code is, which is a positive climate of, of industrial relations. I do believe that. Um, that's, that's, that's huge. Sylvia, you wanted to add a Yeah, comment. I just wanted to say that John makes, makes a really good point. The MPA was absolutely right for its time and it absolutely helped us deliver T5. We would not have been able to do that without the MPA. However, each major project has to consider the right IR infrastructure for its environment. And that is so important to bear in mind. And I think what we've got here with HS2, we have an IR infrastructure that's been set up that can deliver. And we have to, we have to put our energy and our passion behind it to make sure it is delivered. Yeah. No, 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 I'm sure there'll be comments online um, on Facebook. Um, uh, that's very helpful. Just moving on, so I'm mindful of other questions. John, you touched on several times, and again, we appreciate your open and transparency of uh, uh, how you want to keep the uh, HS2 engaged. 
um, particularly we're getting, we've got colleagues from the union that have joined the, um, the delegates. And the, some of the questions that are sort of emerging is around how can they assist with the smooth implementation and delivery? Is there something practical that you can do? The, Kent, uh, the delegates are referencing uh, other models like Hinkley Point, for example, that is a tripartite approach being taken. Just useful to get your thoughts. Do you think just working through this sort of binary approach through the code is, is, is sufficient, or do you see other areas that will help um, enhance that engagement? Well, look. Fostering and sustaining a positive climate, a constructive climate of industrial relations, employee relations, it's a shared responsibility. It's, it's easier for people looking in at HS2 to assume that we can just wield a big stick and, and demand uh, that contractors have an employment model. Um, as Sylvia said, there, there are different models of employment. There are different... Uh, organizational designs within the construction industry itself so it's not a one-size-fits-all Jay and in terms of how do we see how do HS2 see um, the benefits if you like of having what I call like something to anchor to such as the JIB uh, National Work Rule Agreement I think that's a good starting point but as we all know not all of the contractors that are employed and currently engaged on HS2 are affiliates to the JIB. Notwithstanding that, we would encourage, we would encourage, as we encourage our, uh, our contractors, our tier one contractors to engage locally with unions. But we can't force them. We can't force them to reach agreement. We can't force them to let go of some of the mistrust and the legacy issues that have tainted, frankly, the industry in the past. All we can do is encourage, and everything that we can do to encourage, we will. The ER code is really clear. We, we expect, we, re we require our contractors to ensure that those well-established industry practices, industry agreements are a minimum. We would, ex we don't, we, we would expect our tier one joint venture contractors just as Sylvia has outlined how Mace are going to approach this, it's down to the contractor, the tier one contractor, to ensure, to ensure that throughout their supply chain, there are no instances of modern slavery, that people do are in receipt of the right level of pay, that people are in receipt of their annual leave entitlement and sick benefits and any other and any other welfare benefits that they've signed up to. But there's only so much we can do, Jay. Yeah. There's yeah. only so much we can do as clients. And, and, and I, I know it, it sort of does come up time, time and time again, uh, and I'm sure Sylvia and, and John can do here about this level of pain here, you know, competitiveness. Um, and, and I think you sort of touched on it, but, you know, making sure that you're pushing that envelope to higher standards. And JRP company members who I think will get into the front of the queue um, of procurement because they're able to demonstrate those high, high standards. But that's the, the sort of challenge around, you know, having a level playing field, people feeling what to what, what's in it uh, from a pricing point of view. But I think you're both making it very clear that's going to be enforced to ensure that level playing field continues throughout the supply chain. So as you say, from the bridge right to the bottom from it's, it's the supply chain is operating to the standard you want. Absolutely. Um, just some practical questions. Um, you may not be able to answer all of these. Um, John, the question is, where are you in your timeline? Uh, when will um, JIB members need to be sort of aware of when to start um, um, getting involved and a little bit more focusing on that? Can you share some of the timelines that you're currently working to engage us to? Well, what, what I think we, we've discussed this previously. I think a starting point um, for us um, would be to invite yourself and colleagues to a meeting of our EIRR forum because it's important. I can't speak for all of my equivalents in the tier one joint ventures. They, they, they have their own um, business plans, their own profit margins, their own models of employment, if you like. 
I think it's a good starting point is for, for, for us to get together, pull together an opportunity for you and your colleagues to engage in a discussion with uh, Sylvia's counterparts, if you like, across all of the tier one uh, principal contractors. And that would be a starting point. I, I don't want to set a direction of travel that sounds good verbally or in principle for that to run into the buffers because there's a lack of understanding or clear engagement with the people at the front end, which are the tier one contractors and, and my equivalents within those, uh, within those joint ventures. So I, I would foresee us, um, it's going to come down to diaries, of course, but I, I would foresee us at, before the end of May of, of having that opportunity to bring the JIB, yourself and others together with the uh, EIR leads from the joint ventures. That would be step one. And, and we'll see what comes from that. Yeah, we'd be like, we'd like to get involved in that, absolutely. Um, and the project itself, John, you're on schedule where you need to be, um, there's nothing sort of falling behind, I think you need to be aware of. No, I, we're on, <laughs> depends what schedule, <laughs> which timeline you're reading. Um, no, 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 um, no uh, obvious barriers or faux pas in terms of timeline at the minute. Um, the, the hybrid bill for phase two is still making its way through uh, the relevant process. Uh, no, we're, we're all good at the minute. And it's been amazing, really, because um, throughout the pandemic, um, we've continued to make progress despite all the, um, the obvious challenges uh, confronting the business with, with the pandemic and everything that goes with it. But no, it's, uh, it's all looking quite good and positive at the minute. Very, very good to hear, John. Thank you. And just some practical questions I think some, some, some colleagues are asking and around how you, you know, when, when JRB members are keen to get involved, um, what are you looking Will you be knowing which companies are JRB members? Will you be set looking um, at our website, for example, will we list all the JRB company members or is the expectation of membership certificates being included in the EQQ or tenders? Or other topics that you might be looking for, how was the sort of practical visibility point you can look for? Well, that goes back really to the, the question of procurement. And like we've been in our PQQ, we ask questions around modern slavery, for example. We don't specifically cite the JIB or the Construction Industry Joint Council at the procurement stage. We do frame questions through the PQQ and then turn them into something more concrete at the works information stage but it's not it's not that prescriptive it's it's kind of high level ethical employment standards for example we reference that um, the EIR code albeit voluntary um, the metrics if you like contained in that if I can just um, maybe briefly share share with you um, what's actually set out in the code if just by way of an example just bear with me if, if you're struggling don't, don't worry well in the code okay the code provides direction to tier one contractors on meeting hs2's expectations with regard to developing and implementing an employee and industrial relations strategy and practices that promote high levels of employee engagement safe work and good health and well-being and reduces the risk of industrial unrest fairness dignity and respect in the treatment of everyone engaged on the project employee engagement and effective workforce communications compliance with industry benchmark standards for wages benefits and other terms and conditions of employment that are no less favorable than those contained within national working rule agreements implementation is a minimum of the national living wage and London living wage for London boroughs with wages and benefits and other terms and conditions of employment for apprentices to be no less favorable than those contained in industry benchmark standards as applicable. Compliance with the blacklisting regulations 2010. Establishing mutually agreed arrangements pertaining to trade union access between the tier one contractors and the unions. 
recognizing good performance, promoting employee well-being, effectively and fairly managing redundancies, and reporting on EIR matters to HS2 in a timely fashion. Now, we've pulled all of those fine words into actual metrics. And if I'm honest with you, from an ERIR perspective, we've, we've started later as an organisation than we had in the areas of EDI, safety and assurance and skills, education and employment. So we believe it should, our approach is based not on personalities because we come and go, all of us, but based on agreements and codes and arrangements that can stand the test of time. And they should be and are hitherto the products of joint discussions with all the stakeholders. So when, when you say to me, um, Jay, when you put the question to me, look, what's next steps in terms of HS2's collaboration with the JIB, what I say to you back is that it's really down to the outcome of engagement with the tier one contractors and what they, and whether they're affiliates and whether they want to be affiliates or whether we could adopt, we could agree to adopt certain standards. For example, the JIB has got um, a live, if you like, uh, dispute resolution process. Now, does it have to be, does it have to be the case that every subcontractor is an affiliate of the JIB? to accept that if there are any disputes over the working rules, that that procedure should be adopted. So I, I'm, looking, I'm looking to develop our approach on good practice, and that is not contingent on necessarily being an affiliate to the JIB. No, no, not that strictly. I'm mindful we're running out of time, guys. So, um... Just want to thank, first of all, our delegates for your participation. And I think those are some great questions. It's going to really make, make this session much more easier for you to chair and to good questions. Again, thank you to our presenters, um, because I know how both of you are extremely busy and giving up your valuable time today and sharing some, I think, some really powerful insights to be really, really helpful. And I think it's fair to say that a major, any major project of this scale can only deliver success, as you both sort of touched on, through proactive engagement and dialogue. I'm glad that this webinar helps to set that tone and, and pace. But listening to our speakers today, I hope you all agree, gives us some optimism and some real positive outlook. Um, I'm delighted that the JIB is able to play such a key and important role in, in this project and going forward. Um, just some practical takeaways. Um, a recording of this webinar will be made available through Jared's YouTube. So if you want to refer back to or share it with a comment, please feel free to do. Um, and we'll send a very short survey just to get your feedback on if you know we've worked at this one this webinar, what we could be doing differently. And if there's any future topics that you want us to cover, we'll be always keen to hear from you. So again, thank you for your time today again and wish you all safe and productive day. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Take thank care. You. Bye bye. bye, -bye.